afternoon and welcome to another of our lunchtime learning sessions at the Academy. Quite a busy week for us this week. Uh, we've got a session this lunchtime, we've got another broadcast on Tuesday evening. And I know that might not sound an awful lot for a whole week, but there's an awful lot of work that goes on in the background for these things. And so for us, it's, uh, it is quite a busy week. Wednesday evening, we're talking about chronic fatigue syndrome. Today, we are talking about sleep apnea. And I've got um, a star guest in the studio with me, uh, an expert on sleep, uh, someone who has lectured internationally, someone whose credits in the uh, the media, the television, the print, the radio, um, extend massively. It's Dr. Neil Stanley. Neil, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Academy. Once again, long time no see. It, it seems to be. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and I'm glad to have you back as well. I don't know whether I mean, something makes me feel that this end of the year, just after the clocks go back, is probably a, a bad time for people's sleeping patterns. I don't know why I should think that, but uh, is that true or not? Yeah, it, it does take some people a while to get over the uh, the, the clock change. Um, it's only an hour. I mean, it's, let's be honest, uh, the, the clock change is no different from moving from Paris to London. So yeah, exactly. it doesn't have a huge issue, but... You know, I, I naturally wake up um, at between 6.30 and 7 o'clock. Uh, and, of course, now I'm waking up at roughly uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, according to my clock, um, which it takes a bit of getting used to. Having a, an extra hour of wake during the day is not as much fun as I hoped yeah. it would be. Well, I wonder if a bigger problem isn't actually the fact that it's just darker at this time of year, because that, um, that probably upsets people as well, doesn't it? Um, oh, that's really you, dark and miserable and raining. It's not great. Uh, you've been on the show a couple of times before. Obviously, you are, as I said, you're a sleep expert, and uh, you've got massive credits to your name. And uh, we've had some entertaining discussions in the past about other people who purport to be sleep experts, which uh, who make the popular press. Um, sleep apnea, though, I mean, that's a, that's a, a reasonably serious medical problem, isn't it? Uh, what's the extent of the problem? Well, sleep apnea is a problem. Um, the, the thing is, we... we... We, we have pretty good figures for men, which is about sort of 6 to 10%. We, what we don't have is good figures for the prevalence in females because it's one of those things that, like snoring, is not thought to be done by ladies. Um, and, and so it's perhaps underreported. Uh, and, and again, it may be underreported across the board because people are actually unwilling to actually seek medical attention so um you know it's common that you know certainly men have been nagged for you know 10 years or so before they finally go to, to their gp and see if they can get the problem sorted out so it may be you know something that people are sort of suffering in silence or just putting up with and that that is a problem because it is a serious medical condition and more importantly, it is eminently treatable, um, which, which is great news because there's almost certainly a treatment for a person's obstructive sleep apnea. So, I mean, you said that um, people might have symptoms for 10 years, but I, I imagine that the vast majority of the public, certainly, and probably many medical practitioners, wouldn't have the faintest idea what those symptoms are. Absolutely. The, 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 the defining thing about obstructive sleep apnea is that you have these pauses in breathing during the night. So the typical pattern is five or six loud snores and then a pause in your breathing that lasts anywhere from 10 to 180 seconds, so up, up to three minutes. And then you have a roaring snort as you overcome the obstruction and then five or six more loud snores and then another pause. And people can have hundreds of these pauses during the night. So unless you have a bed partner to tell you that you are doing this, you may actually be completely unaware of it. But the consequences of this, one sort of physically, it massively increases your blood pressure and therefore increases your risk of heart disease and stroke. Um, but two, it also causes you to feel incredibly sleepy during the day. So you will find that your performance is impaired, your memory is impaired, uh, your reaction time and things like that. You just don't feel uh, on top of your game. And the issue is that for many people, they confuse the symptoms of uh, sleep apnea with just getting old. So it's, you know, what can I expect? I'm old, I'm knackered, I'm falling to bits, and therefore 
you know, what can I, you know, this is just a natural consequence of aging. Uh, and that's the issue. People are willing to put up with it because they don't see it as a problem and and the, you as I say your bed partner may say well you're you're snoring you're pausing breathing you're disturbing my sleep but the apneic person might just say well you know i don't i don't notice i'm asleep of course it doesn't it doesn't matter to me and then it's once you get that connection that the breathing problem during the night and the daytime symptoms are directly connected that's when you will probably go and see your clinician. The problem with clinicians is that they have been drummed into them that sleep apnea occurs in mid fat middle-aged men. Uh, collar size over 17 and a half or 18 inches is their sort of defining criteria. But the worst case... Say? Are you serious? Yes, but, absolutely. But it, 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 the collar size over 17 and a half or 18 is is their defining criteria so they'll look at you and say bit of bit of a uh, fat around the neck you might be an apneic the worst patient i ever saw was thin 16 and female so if you almost certainly if you're female the doctor is hardly likely to suspect apnea um, and certainly if you're a woman of a certain age and you go into the doctor and say you know i'm not feeling my best i'm not sleeping uh, as well as i used to i you know i don't feel great during the day he's almost certainly going to you know talk about your hormones and menopause long before he would ever perhaps suspect sleep apnea so there is a there is a, a an issue in in the recognition of apnea between the between the uh, sexes yeah, and I, and I guess you, you've hit on one of the key problems for virtually everything we discuss on this show there, that there are so many things that we have discussed with other guests about that, that cause fatigue during the day, whether it's B12 deficiency or hormonal problems and so on. And working out what the root cause is must be quite tricky. But you said um, obstructive sleep, sleep apnea, um, which presumably means that there is another form of sleep, ap sleep apnea. There is a much rarer f form of sleep apnea called central sleep apnea. So with obstructive sleep apnea, uh, it's, a, it's a mechanical problem. The airway closes, you're breathing against that blockage, uh, and mm. then you overcome that blockage, and that's where you get the roaring snort. You overcome the blockage. You then uh, go back to sleep and, and snore again. But there is a much rarer variant called central sleep apnea, which is essentially the brain forgets to breathe, uh, to, to put it very, very simply. Um, and it, it only it takes the changes in the in, in the pressure and in the uh, chemistry of the blood to sort of kickstart the brain to remember to breathe again. Um, and there's also a, a, a variant where you have this mixed, you have both central and obstructive. But central is, as I say, vanishingly rare, uh, whereas obstructive, as I say, is, is probably after insomnia is probably the most common uh, sleep disorder, medical sleep disorder. Um, so it needs to be, the, the presentation looks the same, except for with obstructive sleep apnea, the chest and diaphragm are moving because you're trying, you're breathing against the blockage. Um, right. There's just no airflow. Whereas with central sleep apnea, you're not breathing. The chest and the diaphragm aren't moving. Um, so that's the defining differentiation between the two. Yeah. You also said earlier that the, um, the problem is often put down to aging. Does that mean it does worsen as you get older? It does, both because of anatomical changes, um, you, 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 you know, you're putting weight on around the neck, but also uh, it, it just, uh, it, it's commonly uh, in women mentioning about the menopause, it, it's common in women, uh, menopausal women, uh, it is just, a, it's just one of those things that changes. It's not to say that it doesn't exist in the younger population. Uh, mm. And again, it may be that uh, it, it is possible in children, certainly, um, to have sleep apnea. It, it uh, increases in, in pregnancy, it increases, as I say, in menopause. Uh, but as I say, as we get older, uh, we just get a bit larger uh, and uh, our necks become a bit uh, bit thicker and that, that can cause, cause the issue. 
So what is the actual blockage? I had in mind there that perhaps it was simply the tongue falling backwards if you're in the wrong position in bed. It's the soft palate falling back uh, as well as the jaw. So with sleep apnea, there are the, the treatment uh, that most people may have heard of is, is CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. And the idea of CPAP is that it is a mask that either covers the nose or the nose and mouth and it blows air through the system and therefore keeps the airway open. Now, CPAP has been around commercially for probably 40 years or so, um, and it is highly effective. It's just that you have to, to wear it, and, and there's a device beside the bed uh, that, that is basically a compressor, and I say it blows air through a, a pipe into the mask. People find that uncomfortable, it dries out the, the, uh, the mouth and the nose, and so people find it difficult to wear. There are advances on CPAP. Uh, there's a version that works more like a, uh, a, a, a scuba diver's regulator, so it only works when you breathe in. It, 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 it puts the pressure in, but when you breathe out, you're not breathing out against the pressure. And there's auto uh, CPAP, which basically adjusts the pressure according to your breathing across the night. So that's, a, that's a, again, a very mechanical uh, way of keeping an airway open. But the device, there's another device called a mandibular positioning device or a mandibular advancement device, which is essentially like a boxer's gum shield. It's fitted by a dentist and you wear it and because you may have a recessed jaw it stops the jaw from falling back and closing the airway um, and this has gained um, a sort of popularity recently because it's less disruptive um, mm -hmm. than wearing CPAP um, but as I say both CPAP and a well-fitted mandibular positioning device uh, can significantly reduce the number of obstructions and therefore improve both sleep and daytime functioning. You can buy mandibular positioning devices uh, on the internet. Basically, they're boil in the bag or boil and bite. You, you get a plastic mold, you bite into it, and it, 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 it uh, hardens, And but they're they're very very cheap um, but they're also not particularly effective right and um, so those mandibular positioning devices are they as effective as cpap if, if, an if, if anatomically it's right for you as say if you have a slightly recessed jaw they are very very mm. effective but again that's not everybody um, and of course uh, like anything um, you know, some people snore through their mouth, some people snore through their nose. Um, and of course, uh, if, if you're wearing a CPAP device that isn't well fitted, you'll get leaks from the mask. Uh, and if you just have a nasal mask and you open your mouth, of course, you know, the airway uh, is all connected and so air will leak. So it, it's, it's, it, you need to get the right mask fitted well um, and you need to wear the device uh, and then it will work. But as I say, for a lot of people, you'll hear, oh, I only wear it for the first four hours of the night. Then I get, you know, annoyed with it or bored with it. So it is it is one of those things that requires mm. perseverance. Um, and you'll see on, you know, social media, you know, people saying how horrible it is, how unsexy it is and, and things like that. It, it, it's sort of rather demonized unnecessarily. So, uh, but, but um, yeah, it, 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 say it's an effective um, treatment. It just you you know the first step is you have to go to the doctor. It's not going to it's not going to cure itself. You have to go to your GP, uh, and you have to have your your the severity uh, of your of your sleep apnea judged and and then and then treated. Let me let me come back to that in just a second. But um, a curiosity of mine here is you've talked about it being a, some of them being a bit like a, a scuba regulator. I obviously wouldn't want to sleep with a regulator in my mouth. It would be very uncomfortable. Um, but is there is there a separate air reservoir, an air tank, or is it simply taking room air and uh, and pumping it's just, it through? It's just, it's just taking room air. I mean the. the CPAPs were invented um, by Colin Sullivan in Australia, oh, late 40s, and essentially he reversed engineered a Hoover. 
and he said, <laughs> suddenly he got it to blow. Uh, and in the in the eighties, when they first came out, they were you know the size of a shoebox. They sounded like a Hoover, and they were a pretty blunt instrument. They they just blew air, and, and this could be at quite a high pressure. Uh, and you would mm. say you'd be breathing against that pressure, and that would be uh, difficult. But as I say that these they have come on leaps and bounds. So I won't say they're silent, but they're sort of whisper quiet now. They're much smaller, and I say the masks have become mm. more comfortable and more well fitted. Uh, but yes, they are they are you know sucking in room air. But they they some of them have have humidifiers on them. Some of them could uh, do humidify the air. Uh, and other, I mean, the people sell creams and lotions for, you know, moisturizing the nose and, and that. So th there's, a, there's a whole industry around uh, sleep apnea. And as I say, it is just designed to get the best device, the best mask for you as an individual. And if, if you're ever walking through an airport, certainly in America, you will see sort of um, middle-aged and elderly men uh, carrying a, a, a more sort of shoebox uh, shaped uh, uh, bag on their shoulder rather than a sort of a briefcase and then that will be their CPAP machine because you know as I say if you wear it and it's instantaneous you wear you wear a CPAP device and you know you will feel much much better more alive and more vital the next day and there are very few things in medicine uh, that are as successful and as quick in being successful as CPAP so uh, people shouldn't be afraid uh, of of uh, going down that route. Yeah, that's that's interesting because we always assume that as you get older, you're going to get more tired, which does make sense. But if this is a problem which increases with age, then potentially that could improve the quality of life for a lot of people um, if you started to get tired in the uh, in, during the day. Indeed, and, and this is this is one of the things, as, as I said earlier, about just accepting things. There are natural changes in our sleep as we age. Um, we lose our deep restorative sleep, so sleep becomes less refreshing, less recuperative. Mm -hmm. So we are liable to wake up not feeling refreshed the way that we did when we were 20. Um, so there's these natural changes, but we have to be aware that there are changes as we get older that can be fixed. So sleep apnea being one of them. Uh, the other one is getting up to pee. If you pee t more than twice a night, that is a problem that you should be looking to being sorted out. And there are good medications that can help in this. So just thinking, as I say, oh, woe is me, what can I expect? That's the wrong way of looking at it. Make sure, you know, don't accept uh, poor sleep uh, is, is a part of aging, nor feeling sleepy during the day. That is not necessarily a, a, a natural part of aging. So, um, yeah. you know, the elderly may nap in the afternoon, but that's to do probably with the fact that they can, not because they need to, but they have the opportunity. If you work nine to five, the idea of having a nap is is zero. So, so uh, let, me, let me drag you back a little bit. Sorry to interrupt you there, Neil. Yeah, um, no if I talk, you said um, you know, if, you, if it's a problem, you should go to your GP. Um, two parts of that, of course, are recognising that it's a problem, and we ought to talk about that a little bit more. But also, what's the GP going to do if you go and say, I'm tired during the day? Well, this, this, is, this is the issue. Um, you you have to be very much more of an advocate for your your health than than just expecting your GP to know what they're doing. Certainly, as I say, in unless you're a, a large middle aged man, the likelihood that the GP will instantly suspect sleep apnea is the issue. So the first thing is is a report from your bed partner. If your bed partner the bed partner can tell you what you're doing during the night in a way that you won't ever know. You could be, you know, severe sleep apneic and not actually know what is occurring in the night mm. so your bed partner will provide the useful information and 
you know, that's the information you need to give to your GP. I stop breathing during the night repeatedly. That's all they'll need to know to suspect sleep apnea. Just saying I'm sleepy or I'm tired during the day isn't going to point them in that direction at all. So it's about the, the noise that you make during the night is important in, in telling your, your doctor. Uh, and then you, you need to advocate for yourself to be sent to the nhs in the uk is is quite good at sleep apnea it's not very good for most other sleep problems but it's quite good for sleep apnea and certainly uh in europe and america sleep apnea is 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 you know well recognized in the uk we're, we're, we're pretty good uh, and so there should be a respiratory uh, sleep center close by to, to most people in the UK and you would get a referral to uh, that sleep center to one measure how uh, uh, severe the sleep apnea is and therefore whether it need be treated. There are now uh, centers in the UK who are using little at home devices um, something like the AccuPebble and that sort of thing, which you get sent in the post, you wear it and it picks up whether you have sleep apnea or not. So that can be used as a, a first pass sort of triage uh, before you get into the sleep lab because there may be a waiting list over it. So that, that some centers are using these more frequently now. Um, and then as I say, the, the key thing um, which is a law that was passed by the EU uh, just before the UK left, uh, and so it is on our statute books, is that if you are a professional driver and it is suspected that you have sleep apnea, uh, you are required to surrender your license until such time as you receive treatment for the sleep apnea. So that's the law, that's what DVL will say, um, that's not what happens in practice, unfortunately, or fortunately, dependent on which way uh, you look at it, but that is how serious sleep apnea is taken, uh, because it affects your daytime performance, it will significantly increase your risk of, of car accidents and other accidents specifically. So as I say, as a commercial driver, um, you should you should be have a very heightened awareness as to whether you are a sleep apnea patient, and and seek treatment as soon as you can. Um, and so you don't have to uh, surrender your license and therefore sort of lose your your ability to to make a living. That makes it sound as though you be busily driving your commercial vehicle and you will suddenly drop off because you're an apneic. Um, I, sus I suspect realistically you will feel drowsy and you'll pull over and go to sleep, won't you? No, uh, you won't. That's the problem. The, the problem is that the more sleepy you are, the less able you are to judge that you are sleepy. And, and that's the issue. You know, we have these signs in the UK on the side of the motorway that says tiredness kills, take a break. By the time you recognise that that's you and you should be taking a break, you are a danger. And so, yes, uh, sleep apnea will cause you to right. uh, have these micro sleeps and therefore massively increase your risk of car accidents. If you're driving along at 60 miles an hour and you fall asleep at the wheel, it will take you four seconds for your car to come off the road. Uh, that's not a long time at all. Um, and so, yes, but sleep apnea significantly increases your risk of car accidents is literally because of that, because of falling asleep at the wheel. And of course, commercial drivers are people who perhaps don't get as much exercise um, and eat uh, healthy food. And so they, they are more prone to sleep apnea. They're, they're, they're sort of the exact population of people who are liable to, to develop sleep apnea. So uh, it, it is something that the, the, the you know, haulage industries, professional drivers should really be uh, very, very aware of. Yeah. Um, just a minute ago, you mentioned a device that um, you might get uh, sent to wear to, to assess your sleep apnea. Um, what's that like? Is that like a Fitbit or is it a bit more complicated? Well, it, it's just a little, uh, there, there's a number of them. They're, they're, they're little devices, you know, quite, really quite small and, and you, you, you stick it on your, on your throat and it picks up the sound 
of the apnea, and, and you know it, it's got a you know sort of a medical adhesive that, that keeps it on there during the night, and then you you literally send it back in the post after a couple of days, and um, so there, there's a, a, a number of these that have have been uh, been sort of done, and and, and they're they're incredibly easy to mm -hmm. use. There's, there's no setup. There's no you know, literally, you just you just put it on and it records. And because, I say, it's picking up a, a sound signal, it, it is quite clear that you have you know very loud sounds and then this this pause uh, in breathing. And so the pattern is very easy to pick up. It's just that we now have the ability to miniaturize these things uh, into a in, into a, a, a neat little device. So as I say that there are a number of, of the, the major respiratory laboratories who use it. Um, because, of course, it, it means that if you have very severe sleep apnea, it will pick it up and they can fast track you rather than having maybe one or two events uh, in the night, which is you know, technically sleep apnea, but is not medically relevant. And so, um, the, you know, there are a number of services who are using these. Yeah. Um, Pip sent in um, her own situation here. Um, she says, uh, I have a deviated septum and my left nostril is permanently congested despite three failed ENT ops to try and help. She's convinced it plays a part in her obstructive sleep apnea and she's now on a waiting list to be put on a CPAP machine. But it's a 15 week wait. Hardly a fast track. Exactly, and that's that's the problem. As I say, the NHS is good, but it's not great um, at, at this, and there are long waiting lists. Yes, a deviated septum can be a, a significant part uh, of of uh, certainly the genesis of snoring, and, and maybe. Uh, for sleep apnea because of course essentially anything that causes air to be turbulent will cause a, a noise uh, and a deviated septum will do that. There is, as I say, there is the problem that, that there are long waiting lists. There's long waiting lists to go into a sleep lab and then there are long waiting lists to get a, a device and then uh, the, the NHS is not as, should we say, proactive in uh, you know, making sure the you know, follow-up visits and all that sort of thing. Um, in the continental Europe, you know, the, in somewhere like Belgium, you would be seen, you know, probably by the end of the week and literally go home with a CPAP machine after the diagnosis that morning, or in the morning after sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, Denmark, Norway, uh, you know, places I know personally um, for this sort of treatment uh, are, are similar. Um, so, as I say, it is an issue. Um, and in many countries, there are private services where you can, you know, get one of these things from the manufacturer yourself. And the manufacturer has a team of technicians and nurses to, to do the follow up. That, again, is not something that is big in the UK because, of course, we have the, the mindset of, of the NHS. Um, you know, we don't we don't pay for things. The NHS gives them to us for free, sort of thing. But it is it is very much a problem. So, uh, well, before I go on, um, Pips also said that she's really scared about uh, wearing a CPAP machine because she thinks it'll be uncomfortable. Um, she's asked if you've got any tips on how you get used to wearing one of these things. I, again, that's about the masks. I mean, if if you know, again, when when I came. Or, you know, when CPAP first came out, the, the masks looked like something that wouldn't look out of place in, in Top Gun. You know, it's, it's a sort of a huge rubber nose and mouth mask. The, 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 you know, going to a sleep conference now, you'll see probably 300 types of different masks. So, you know, with silicon seals, uh, very lightweight. Um, so they, 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 they should be one out there that is comfortable and, and worth wearing. Um, and the re how you get used to it is by convincing yourself that it is medically necessary. You need to do it. You wear it, you will feel great. And it concentrating on the feeling great rather than uh, feeling uh, mm. uncomfortable. It, it, it's just, as I say, you you get used you can get used to anything as long as you persist and let's say there are so many benefits of getting your sleep your your, your sleep apnea treated that then it's worth carrying on. Well, I guess also as you said a moment ago that uh, the benefits are immediate, so Pip will experience that straight away almost uh, certainly if if uh, apnea is a problem. 
Absolutely. If, if, if the mask fits, there's no leaks uh, and she wears it, then the next day she, she literally she should wake up a new person. And I say there's very, very few things in medicine you can ever, ever say that about. So, I mean, that's the, yeah. that's the positive. Uh, what's the uh, what's the what's the further route from you know, under the NHS? Um, Charlotte said that she had her tonsils and adenoids removed about four years ago, um, and it cured her um, obstructive sleep apnea. She does say that the recovery from the op was horrendous, though. Yes, are there other, other remedies in the NHS? There can be there can be surgery. Surgery is is a can be in, implicated in certain people. The um, to, to basically cut away some of the, the fleshy bit of the soft palate. There are a number of ways of doing this. One is a surgeon with a scalpel slashing away relatively randomly. Uh, the other one is using uh, lasers or using heat. Uh, so you, you just heat the uh, soft palate and... and, and, and um, short, smooth, well, shorten it or, or, or reduce it in size that way. The, the, it's, it's known as a U triple P, and please don't ask me to pronounce what that stands for. Um, but it is essentially what an ENT surgeon could do. The issue is, it is it is a pretty imprecise uh, operation, um, and it makes things better in a good number of people it has no effect in probably a large number of people and can even make the situation worse in maybe 20 percent of the people so just being offered a, a, an operation is not necessarily uh, the end of all your problems um, and uh, knowing the reputation of your surgeon and his success rate of your surgeon is very very key to this and again this is not something that is done in the in, in the uk we don't get lead tables of, of surgeons um you know i have a personal friend uh in in he practices both in denmark and and, and in norway as an ent surgeon and if i ever had a problem i would definitely go and see this man because i know he, he you know he, i know his reputation I, i've seen the success of his work but you know that's a privileged position for me to know that your your who job is he? in who is he? <laughs> is, is professor sorenberg who works uh, predominantly at the levisenberg hospital in oslo um and, right. and his colleagues there's a number of colleagues there i mean it's one of the leading centers well, it's the leading center in scandinavia um so the, the, so yes you know these things um but as i say within the nhs you, you know it, it can just be a, a hit and miss affair um and but you know there are other there are other things that can help i mean you're know, talking earlier about having a, a, a large neck um you know, losing weight um, can help. Um, some people only experience this if they're sleeping on their back um, because, of course, you know, everything drops back. So sewing a tennis ball in the back of your pyjamas so you can't lie on your back. You know, so some of these things may reduce uh, sleep apnea. It won't make the sleep apnea go away, but then, you know, it may drop it from being a bit of a problem to so what you know it, 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 it's not going to do anything for severe sleep apnea but they say there are lifestyle changes you know some people may only do it when when they when they've drunk alcohol um so uh, so i say that, that at both ends there's the extreme end of surgery but there is some lifestyle changes but, if, but i say the, the first thing is to acknowledge that you have sleep apnea and that it is uh, an issue that you wish to have uh, to, to, to resolve, to have fixed. If you don't do that, then nothing's going to help. Um, just going back to the sleep labs that you mentioned, assuming that you get through your, however long the waiting list is, um, how long would somebody have to spend going to a sleep lab for them to sort out the problem or diagnose it? They, they, they can be done in one night. Um, there's something called a split night study, which is essentially where you wear, you, 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 you don't wear the device for half the night and then they put the device on for the second half the night. 
it would depend on how accurately uh, they can get the pressure, how, how much they need to set the, the, the air pressure on, on the device. That, you know, that can be, as I say, a single night. Uh, other labs may do two nights just to make sure that they've, they've, they've got the right uh, thing. But as I say, with an automatic device, um, th there would be no need to have the titration. The, autom the automatic device would do that on its own. Um, but again, these things are more likely to be done in private practice um, because they cost more than a standard CPAP and therefore in the NHS you're probably going to get you know, at least last year's model um, rather than the latest tech. Um, there is no, as I say, you can purchase these devices yourself uh, if you have the money, and, and, and you know, buy it's like you know, buying a car, uh, you you can get something with all the you know bells and whistles on, um, but it's going to cost you more money. Um, the the, the, the same, the same. Say, what will it cost? What sort of figures are we talking about? Anything from a few hundreds to a few thousand pounds. Right. Um, dependent on, on, as I say, on you know the how quiet it is, how small it is, how light it is, whether it's automatic or bind level or whatever. Uh, you know, these things can can cost a lot of money, but it, it, it's as I say, it, it, or as I say, you wait for the you wait for the NHS to uh, to you know the wheels to grind slowly on the NHS. Well, while we're on the subject of devices, um, someone who's called Potato Viewer on my list, and I really ought to know who Potato Viewer is by now, um, but they've asked, will any smartwatches or other devices that monitor sleep flag up any problems like sleep apnea? Not necessarily, um, because they're not that accurate in measuring the stages of sleep. Um, if they have a... Uh, a variable called sleep fragmentation or something related to the fragmented nature of sleep, this might give you an indication of a, a lower quality of sleep and that may indicate potentially sleep apnea. Um, but not, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, smart watch that actually specifically measures sound in this regard. Um, and so it would merely be a, you know, a possible, ex, you know, it, it would make you think, is there something wrong? And maybe sleep apnea could be the thing that's wrong. But as I say, a million times more accurate than that is your, your wife or your girlfriend nudging you in the ribs, telling you, you know, for God's sakes, why do you stop breathing in the night? Um, you know, that, that, that's 100% yeah. accurate. Um, but uh, yeah, in my, in my case, in my, in my case, it's because she's holding the pillow over my head generally. But uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. So that that would give you that indication. So um, no, I, I say that you've either got these the devices we talked about earlier, which some of these respiratory services are using, um, or your your bed partner report. Those are the two most likely ways you are to find out. Let me, let me rush through a few uh, questions because we're, we're coming to the end of the program. Um, Christina says, is central sleep apnea linked with sudden adult death syndrome? Uh, not, that, not that anybody, because it's so rare, it, it's not really known. I mean, the likelihood that you'd get a diag you'd have central sleep apnea, you'd get a diagnosis of sleep apnea, and then that get tied up with um the sudden death syndrome is very very rare there, there may be a link uh, but the literature mm. suggests that nobody's ever died of sleep apnea you know you the body usually decides to start breathing again okay um shandy's asked uh, if there's a treatment for central sleep apnea Unfortunately not. We, we, we have, you know, it is a brain issue that we, we really don't know, uh, w you know, what the genesis of it is, why the brain would do such a seemingly silly thing. Uh, it, it doesn't sort of make sense. I have to say, that you, you said right at the outset that people can stop breathing for three minutes. That is a very long time not to breathe. You can't consciously do it. 
But of course, when you're asleep, you're not conscious. So the mm. so what you're relying on is the uh, say the pressure receptors and the chemo receptors in the body to say, hang on, the blood's becoming a bit acidic. We need to stop that and therefore breathe. Whereas as a as a if you're trying to do it voluntarily, you'll you'll you're chicking out, shall we say, um, before you go that far. Of course, you know, yeah. we, we know that there, there are these people who free dive who can hold their breaths for extended periods of time. But, yeah, it's because you're not conscious of what's happening that you don't consciously think, oh, you know, I really need to breathe now. Yeah. Um, Simon's asked if asthmatics are more likely to suffer. Not... Again, not necessarily, because I say it is a physical blockage um, mm. that you're breathing against in the upper airway. Asthma is, is much you know, deeper down in the lungs. So, um, again, it, you know, they, they can exacerbate each other, but it's not as though one causes the other. Yeah, okay. Um, AJ's asked if you've got any experience of Boteco breathing techniques and whether they can help. Uh, there is there is uh, evidence from uh, practitioners who claim that it helps. Uh, there is less scientific evidence that there is any uh, any mm. benefit for it. Is that uh, as is so often the case because nobody's paying for the research? I don't know if there's a if there's a big pharma interest in selling CPAP machines or whatever. <laughs> There isn't, there isn't an interest. I mean, the, the thing is, Bateco method has, you know, has a very uh, unscientific reputation. Um, th there's almost nothing in the scientific literature about it. Um, but, of course, if, if you have a problem, you know, it is a, it's a breathing problem that occurs during the night. If you optimize your breathing, um, it, it may be possible. I mean, we know for, for things like snoring, which is not necessarily linked with sleep apnea, we know that uh, playing the didgeridoo and opera singing have both been shown to strengthen the, the, uh, the muscles in the neck and therefore reduce snoring. Whether it's sufficient to reduce sleep apnea, we don't know. But we do know yeah. that breathing exercises, um, but as I say, the Swiss group showed playing the didgeridoo um, helps, but there hasn't been the same sort of research shown for Boteco. I don't know why, uh, but it just has a bad, re not a bad, it has a non-scientific reputation. Yeah, and I'm guessing that the didgeridoo is not yet available on the NHS. Um, <laughs> Julian, Julian's asked about mouth taping. Um, any advantage in that? I think you and I have discussed this before, actually, on a previous show. Yeah, mouth taping is, is, is something that is very, very popular now because of TikTok and various sportsmen, etc., uh, advocating mouth taping. The problem is that um, humans were designed with a nose and with a mouth, and, and they are both necessary uh, to breathe. Um, and if you tape your mouth up and if you cough or choke during the night, it can be significantly dangerous to your health to do so. So um, there are tapes that you can use that don't actually close the mouth up. They just pull the chin up. Um, but uh, their effectiveness, again, hasn't been shown, um, whereas there are potential downsides for them. I'm not entirely sure how I would see sleep, uh, sleep apnea being beneficially affected by taping, because if it's a blockage problem, simply taping the mouth wouldn't seem to me to overcome that. If anything, it, it would compound it. it. it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have help in that direct sense, but it does help, uh, or it is thought by the people who, who, who claim that it helps, it is thought to... Um, force your breathing through the nose and therefore um, if it's a recessed jaw issue uh, then forcing it through the nose may yeah. sort of o overcome some of that but it's it, again it, it's not a mecha mechanistic thing for the, the back of the throat and so that, that's what I'm saying it's overclaiming but it, it could reduce the snoring uh, which people see as potentially part of the disturbance that is caused by sleep apnea it's not the pauses it's the loud snoring that disturbs your bed partner 
Last question from the audience. Vicky says there's an app called Sleep Cycle, which monitors your breathing and movement on your phone. Um, quick answer. What do you think about apps like that? Uh, they, they can provide some information that can be beneficial, but they are not hugely accurate uh, and they should not be taken uh, as a you know go no go situation you, just because your your app tells you that you're fine doesn't necessarily mean you're fine you need to listen to your body um, right. and not rely on technology to tell you how you feel you should know how you feel very simply and these things are supplementing your your or, or making you think that you're, you're you're feeling better or worse depending on which way it goes and then you actually are so listen to your body and if your smartwatch or your uh, app confirms how you feel then fine if it goes against how you feel trust yourself not the uh, not the technology Thanks. Uh, Neil, the last, very last question, you're probably allowed a two-word answer on this at most. Um, given that one of the symptoms of uh, sleep apnea is tiredness, is it possible it could be mistaken or misdiagnosed as chronic fatigue? Absolutely. Uh, again, uh, if, if, you're, if your GP doesn't know um, about either, I mean, and both of them are you know, slightly Cinderella subjects, um, yeah. you, you know, yes, of course it can be. Neil, thank you. And um, sorry to rush you on that last question, but we are out of time. We've had 442 people watching, so it's clearly a topic which interests uh, a large number of practitioners like myself. Uh, thanks for sharing your expertise. And I hope it won't be quite so long before we get you on the show again, because, uh, yeah, it's, it's always entertaining talking to you. Um, but I, thank you very much for giving up your time today.